unsolved crimes newspaper as a response to Cavalier civil society organization within the framework of a struggle against religious extremism presents. There's this odd phrase called margin of appreciation, which basically means that the original members were allowed to do anything they wanted in terms of regulating religion. James Richards, Foundation Professor of Sociology and Judicial Studies, Director of Judicial Program, University of Nevada, Reno. Would you mind telling, please, what is a sect, destructive cult, and what is their goal? Are they scientific concepts? I've sent you some materials that demonstrate that I do not think they're scientific concepts. I view them as uh, what I would call a social weapon to use against groups that you do not like. Uh, they're part of an effort to exert social control over unpopular groups or groups that someone in a position of power does not like. Are there any analytical criteria according uh, to which one can tell that is a sect or he is an adherent of a sect? Uh, the technical definition of a sect is that it is a spin-off group from uh, a more recognized uh, religious group or political group for that matter. Uh, these terms have been used in the political arena as well. But it's a spin-off group that uh, some people take issue with maybe some interpretation that the leaders of a religious organization adopt and so they set up uh, another organization somewhat similar. If you start looking at what we call the anti-cult literature, you have all kinds of criteria that they list, such as having an authoritarian leader and brainwashing their members and mm -hmm. things like that. But those are not technical terms at all. The term sect is a time-honored term in the sociology of religion. It simply means some group that withdrew out of a larger group to affirm some kind of truth that they thought the larger group had abandoned. Can journalists make such kind of conclusions? Well, they shouldn't, but they do. Many journalists are interested in seeing their name and their copy in print. They follow uh, fads and fashions, and in recent decades, in Western countries, uh, it's been fashionable to attack cults and accuse them of all sorts of things. But uh, I've done media studies and uh, many journalists just accept whatever the anti-cult movement representatives have to say. Uh, some will, will uh, do more serious work and actually interview people like myself and colleagues of mine, mine who do similar research, but as I'm sure you're aware, there are organizations and individuals that are part of the anti-cult movement that get a lot of media. They're very adept at getting media coverage and the press, the journalist, look for an easy way to get a story, will depend on them and, and call on them and treat them as experts. A journalist can be sued for libel, uh, but that's very rare. Uh, usually what would happen is someone would try to rebut them and get something in print or get interviewed on television station. There are some uh, orga journalist organizations that have, I mean, they have codes of conduct and you can, it's very difficult and time consuming, but you could bring ethical charges against journalists if they're part of some professional organization. I actually saw that happen in Australia a time or two successfully where a major newspaper, the major newspaper in Melbourne ended up having to print a retraction of a story uh, because uh, ethics charges were brought against uh, the paper and the journalist and uh, basically a trial was held. I actually testified in the trial and uh, the, the newspaper ended up having to agree to print a retraction and apology, but that's extremely rare and difficult and very time-consuming. 
So it's about the best you can do is try to get some kind of airtime or print time to rebut comments that are made. But it's it's virtually it's very difficult to do because the editors of a newspaper or those running a television station they have the final decision about who gets printed and who gets airtime. So it's very rare that that sort of thing happens. What the programming and exit counseling actually are? Are there any differences between them? Would you mind giving some examples of such cases that you might have faced and how it ended for both sides? Well, deprogramming uh, used to be very prevalent in America. There were several thousand uh, young people kidnapped, even though they were of legal age, kidnapped out of religious groups and put through a very rigorous resocialization process. Mm -hmm. um, I got in, I've been involved in some of those cases, so I could talk about them at a great length, like a write a book. Uh, those cases uh, uh, were all, nearly always civil cases. Regrettably, the law enforcement people uh, were very seldom involved. Uh, with criminal charges, even though these were young adults being kidnapped and incarcerated. Uh, so what ended up happening is a number of what we call civil actions were taken where the person being deprogrammed, uh, if, if the deprogramming was unsuccessful and, or they escaped from their captors, uh, they would sue, some of them would sue <coughs> in civil court for false imprisonment and intentional infliction of emotional distress and other charges in civil court. Uh, those were very difficult cases to win. Occasionally someone, some cases were won, but they were tried before juries and juries uh, had generally accepted that this was a cult and the person was trapped inside the cult and uh, that the deprogrammers, even though they kidnapped someone of age, legal age, they were supposedly rescuing them. The Federal Bureau of Investigation might be involved if someone was kidnapped and taken across the state line. That makes it a federal crime in America. But those cases, there were only a couple of times in all the history of the deprogramming that any federal charges were brought against the deprogrammer. One of those occurred in Washington, D.C., and it only happened to, it only occurred because the deprogrammers kidnapped the wrong person. They kidnapped the roommate of the person they were supposed to kidnap, and uh, the federal authorities decided that warranted filing kidnapping charges against them, and, and they did. But it's very rare, again, because of the general acceptance of the anti-cult anti perspective and the fact that we use juries in America for those kinds of, of cases. Uh, there were some victories, however, uh, occasional victories, and they uh, basically led to the demise, the stopping of overt deprogramming in America uh, and a, a new kind of profession, quasi-profession called exit counseling developed where basically a person would be put through exit counseling only if they ended up agreeing to it. Now getting someone to agree to it, uh, you know, young people could be browbeaten, coerced by their parents and others to accept the exit counseling, but basically deprogramming died in America after some very important court cases that are alluded to in some of the materials I sent you. Uh, and then exit counseling came to, into being. But you don't hear much about it anymore because, frankly, very few people would agree to no, allow themselves to be put through some kind of rigorous resocialization. And so there's not very much exit counseling going on. If you want to know where deprogramming is occurring, however, now, go to Japan. It's still occurring. What uh, brainwashing is um, from an analytical point of view? 
that's almost an ex oxymoron because brainwashing is not a scientific term. It's a social weapon that you use against a group you don't like. Uh, uh, it's become an a everyday term. It, it's so interesting to realize that the term brainwashing first appeared in the early 1950s in a book written by a man named Edward Hunter. But now it's used everywhere. It's, it, anytime someone doesn't like education techniques or resocialization techniques or socialization techniques for that matter, uh, they talk they talk about it in terms of brainwashing, which is a very negatively connoted term. As I pointed out in a recent article, it's even now uh, playing a role in child custody disputes. Uh, some men who want to retain custody of their children in a divorce action are accusing the wives of brainwashing their children to not like the father and say that they want to stay with the mother. And so it, it's so fascinating to watch how this term has spread when it's actually less than 70 years old. The first time it ever appeared in English, in an English book, was uh, in 1951. But it, it's a term without scientific meaning, uh, but basically it, it refers to, it typically refers to some kind of uh, alleged process, psychotechnique, uh, where someone can have their brain totally change, their mind totally change from one allegiance to another by some hypnotic means. Uh, there used to be a, a kind of an assumption in America that if you came within 30 feet of a member of the Unification Church, a Mooney, and they locked gaze with you, you were lost forever, which is ridiculous, of course. And the high attrition rates of the Unification Church and other of these groups clearly demonstrates that the brainwashing didn't work very well, even if it worked at all. Mm -hmm. There are many incidents of defamation and slander against individualist and organization, including commercial and non-religious ones. Be leaving them as a sect or a cult without any reason. In your opinion, why are they doing it? Uh, if you can successfully label a group or an organization yes, as a no. sect or a cult, you have achieved a, a huge amount of power over them and the, the right, uh, in quotes, the right to exert social control over them. Uh, and, and do terrible things to them. If, if uh, a, a person is a member of a re regular religious organization that is accepted as a religious organization, then they can exert their rights to freedom of religion, which is a human right, and is, uh, you know, detailed in constitutions around the world. Uh, but if you can say this is not a religion, it is a sect or a cult, then it doesn't qualify for those protections and you can do anything you want to to them. Treat them badly, beat them up, uh, you can even kill them. And some people will think that's just okay because they were, after all, a member of this terrible group. So uh, it's the labeling. In sociology, we have this theory called labeling theory. If you can attach a derogatory concept to an individual or a group, well, if someone says you're a, sec a member of a sect or a cult, how can you prove you're not? Uh, it's a, you, you can make your arguments, as, as you, some of you have been trying to do, but uh, it's once that label is put on you, if the media accepts it, starts printing it, the general public reads the media, so you're, you're very handicapped in defending yourself if that label is placed on you. What is the historic role of Dworkin in manipulation policy on labeling non-religion organization as destructive cult and sex? And Dworkin has played a major role in that with his writings and his uh, statements, his activities. Uh, as you know, I, the first thing I said to you folks was an article about the case in Moscow where... Yes, I know. Uh, in 1998. 
Yes, I, I testified in that case as did Eileen Barker and Marat Steer and, and, and many and others. Uh, that, that was a very fascinating experience. Uh, but he, he was being sued personally, but everyone understood he was representing the Orthodox Church. And what happened in that case demonstrated he, he became a leader in this uh, coming together of the Russian Orthodox Church with some very conservative nationalistic politicians in Russia. And uh, he's, he's been, I, I have to admit, he's been quite effective. Uh, he has the backing of the political structure, and he obviously has the backing of the church. I, I think it's a, in the long run that history will not remember him well, and that the church will be criticized in future historical treatments for giving him the free reign that they have given him. But uh, he, he's a very effective and, and important person. I know he's a, a gain some critics, I'm delighted to see that that's happening, uh, where some people think he's gone too far and should be reined in. Uh, but uh, so far, I think he's, he's still there, still quite effective. If he goes after someone, it takes a lot of effort to overcome that. Do you think that such a product as Dworkin is a big mistake of Russian Orthodox Church? I think in the long run it is a big mistake. Uh, my own view is that the Russian Orthodox Church would be much better served if it would try to figure out what the people need and want and respond to those needs instead of simply trying to stifle any kind of competition. How quickly they signed on with the conservative nationalistic politicians and, and helped them in their effort to uh, regain power in Russia I frankly think is a long-term embarrassment, but uh, you know, right now they're doing what they think they should be doing and uh, doing it fairly effectively with the help of the politicians. Facts and uh, that provision Dworkin on human rights, violations and violence against adherents of totalitarian sect, are they reliable? Well, the trial was a very odd thing where he, you know, he defended himself. He was his own counsel. He was in the courtroom. He, he questioned me. I testified for one entire afternoon, and he was the questioner. Uh, he was not very effective, but it turns out he didn't have to be effective because the, the judge and the other members of the tribunal uh, ended up simply following orders and ruled in favor of him and the church. Uh, they weren't interested in the facts, uh, and in fact, uh, I, I think I mentioned this in the article that I sent you, he actually ended up attacking a member of the Hare Krishna who had a video camera during the trial, and, and he, act he actually got arrested for doing that, but of course he, was, he wasn't retained and charged and anything, but Policeman did take him away briefly because he attacked this uh, hard, hard Christian member who was videotaping the trial. Uh, he was out of control. But as I said, it didn't matter. If you read that article, you recall how the trial ended. It ended very abruptly with a clear demonstration of <clears throat> what Westerners and maybe some in Russia and Ukraine referred to as telephone justice. It was very obvious that that last day the trial in, took place when people went in thinking it was going to be an ordinary trial and every seat in the place was occupied by a representative of the Russian Orthodox Church in full garb. And when, it, when the judge came in with the two lay judges, the leader of the group stood and offered, said, asked permission to offer a prayer for the, the judge, and the judge granted permission, and the, this person, this bishop, then uttered a prayer thanking the judge for the, the ruling they were about to deliver. 
when he finished the trial, the prayer, the judge picked up her gavel and said, this trial is over, I rule in favor of Mr. Dworkin, and I'm going away to the Black Sea to take a vacation, and I will write my opinion while I'm there. So it was, it was obviously a put-up job, but someone had made some telephone calls and organized this demonstration and organized this decision. And so the whole thing was a bit of a sham, although it went on for several weeks before this fateful day when it, a decision was made to end the trial. A number of European, European and Russian experts believe that activities of Fekris and its vice president Dworkin are extreme. What is your opinion of this? Oh, there's no question they're extreme. Uh, regrettably, they're also fairly effective. Uh, <clears throat> every time I read something about one of Dworkin's latest antics, I wonder if this is the one that's finally going to be defined as too far. I mean, there, there may come a time when the politicians tire of him if he embarrasses them continually, if they care what people think. I mean, you know, the tensions between Russia and the West, and particularly the United States, uh, actually assist Dworkin in maintaining his position. Uh, if he's attacked from the West and, and from people in America, uh, that's just defined away and dismissed as, as more Western propaganda, and it actually regrettably uh, may help him. But if, if political leaders in Russia decide that the embarrassments he causes Russia within academic communities in the West, if they ever decide that matters, then he will be gone quickly. Uh, politicians and other Public figures in Russia have a way of being erased quickly if the decision is made to do so. Uh, you know, there are these stories about photographs being doctored so that someone doesn't even appear in the photograph where they were there when it was taken, but they take them out of the photograph, that sort of thing. So he could disappear quickly if the authorities tired of his antics, but uh, given the geopolitical tensions between Russia and the West, uh, I'm not looking for that to happen very soon, regrettably.